uh, first three steps and strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today. Today, Mitch and I are going to take a look at some fundamentals with hockey players, looking at both the off-ice and the on-ice, and where players should start, whether they're well along in their career or they're just starting out, but looking at some key components that make up those fundamental skills that are going to help players become better athletes and obviously better players on the ice. And we'll begin first with uh, talking a little bit more about basically looking at the athletic position of a player. So if we take a look, Mitch, at a player coming into the gym or on the ice. I know for myself on the ice, I would start with just as simple as a hockey player position. So looking at their head up, their shoulders are square, arms are in a good position, and then the important parts of their lower body. So good knee bend. Um, we always go back to fundamentals as far as shoulders over your knees, knees over your toes. And we want the weight of that player on the ball of their foot. So on that big bump under their big toe is where we want them to be positioned. And that'll allow them to be able to create any kind of movement from that position once they get it and the other one of the other key things we see is a player's foot base and we talk about a wide base or a short base a player spends most of the game in a wide base meaning their their feet are going to be spread out wider than their shoulders so whether they're shooting or pivoting or transitioning those feet are going to widen out a little bit but when they do start on a quick start or they they're skating we want that base to be tight and a tight base doesn't mean feet together a tight base means feet kind of shoulder distance apart so getting into that athletic position is very, very important for, as a starting point for any player. And we even see players at the pro level that don't have a good base on their hockey player position. Maybe they're too hinged at the hip, meaning their shoulders are way over their toes. Uh, maybe they're not getting low enough, their knees aren't bent. And a lot of that stuff, those little inefficiencies, although they're playing at a high level, still hinder the max amount of speed they can get or power they can generate. Awesome. Yeah, so... On the off-ice side of things, I mean, basically we look at a variety of different movements. So can a player hinge at their hips? Can a player bend from their knees? Can a player do a lunge pattern? Can a player work through protraction and retraction and let's say a horizontal pushing and pulling motion, so like a push-up or a ring row or something like that? And can they do like an overhead movement? So like do their shoulder blades move in an upward rotation on their shoulder, on their rib cage? Um, and all those just kind of just basic movement patterns. So that's a, no resistance. That's just like, how does this player move? Um, how does their core connect the rib cage to their pelvis? Do they have a huge arch in their lower back or are they able to really connect um, their upper body to their lower body? So once they understand all these things, <clears throat> then we're able to jump into um, like a strength and conditioning program. Like for example, if we have say a trap bar deadlift, a deadlift, a squat in a program, they can't do any of that stuff unless they know how to hinge at their hips or bend from their knees. So, I mean, we have to cover that stuff first. Um, and like you've said, so on the ice in their hockey player position, there's an element of ankle flexion, there's an element of knee flexion, there's an element of hip hinging, but you don't want too much or too little of any of those things. And if off the ice we can teach them just the basics when they're in their shoes, then they get on the ice, I think they can pick those things up a lot faster. So basically our starting point is very motor control and movement uh, focused. We're not focused on lifting the heaviest weights they can or we're not focused on running as fast as they can. It's just about gaining some awareness around movement and how your body moves and how that relates to, say, a hockey player position or how that relates to a deadlift. Um, and then we can use those tools to, to build from there. Yeah, and the one thing I find difficult with hockey <clears throat> coaches and instructors is uh, when a player's on the ice – the player loves pucks. I mean, that's the one number one thing they want to play with, right? <laughs> so taking time to step back and just working on those fundamentals, like a hockey player position, which is massively boring yeah. um, and sucks sometimes for the coaches because yeah. it's a bit of a drag just working on those basics. But spending a little bit of time maybe incorporating that into a drill or the start of a drill and getting players in that proper position is huge. And then being able to progress into passing and pucks and all that stuff. But um, many times, unfortunately, you know, we're, we're off ice, you can structure a program and have the player simply do simple moving, pat uh, sorry, simply simple moving patterns like a squat or things like that, that are very basic and easy before they can progress through. A lot of times on the ice players will just get pushed through. Mm -hmm. It's almost like going to elementary school now. You just get pushed to that next grade, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> so, whether you're ready or not, yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. So now, you know, a lot of players get pushed all the way through. Now we see them in Pee Wee or Bantam, and they're 13, 14, 15, and their mechanics are terrible. Maybe they've grown a little bit, but maybe they've never been taught those fundamentals, and now we got to recorrect it at that point. Um, and it is a lot harder to fix players that are older compared to fixing players when they're young and they're you know, yeah, kind I mean, of a piece of Play-Doh, right? 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of kids will come in and I'll ask them, like, have you, you know, done off-ice training before? And they're like, they want to say yes, but almost you, you as a coach almost want to hear, no, I haven't done this before because it's way easier to create good habits from, like, a clean slate than it is to erase everything that they've kind of ingrained and then re, re, um, reteach it. So that's, a, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the same kind of thing. It's the, the best is getting a player that's pretty green. You yeah, know, have you ever sure. been taught how to shoot properly? No, not really. Awesome. awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we can go through these fine points and hopefully correct some of that stuff and, and you know, move on from there for sure. Yeah. Um, once a player has that, that body awareness and that positioning on the ice, then for us on the ice, the biggest thing from there is going to be edging. So balance on your edges and agility on your edges uh, but being able to control your body on your edges because every skating movement is going to come from our edges, or either our inside edge or our outside edge, depending on what we're doing. So we really try to focus on getting a player, uh, first of all, to understand what their edges are. So at young ages, we always ask the question, how many edges on a skate? There's two. There's an inside edge and an outside edge. And oftentimes, I'll get weird answers like there's seven edges or eight edges. There's <laughs> an inside front and outside back. And I mean, as hockey players, we're dumb. So let's just keep it real, real simple. Uh, there's an inside edge and there's an outside <laughs> yeah, there's, edge. There's it's two. very simple. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, so we kind of move <laughs> that way with the players and really get them to understand what their edges are, how they work, and where their body position should be on their blade as they're moving around. And unfortunately, we're on a bit of a rocking chair with our blades because most times they're rockers. So you are going to rock onto your heel or onto your toe. The quicker you can get back to the ball of your foot in that stable position, the better player you're going to be and the more consistent, more balance you're going to have. So really trying to get players to understand their edges and how to use them properly. So working on inside edge drills or outside edge drills and then combining the feet. And this is another area that I think a lot of coaches maybe neglect a little bit, but really focusing on one foot at a time. So if a player's going around, make them just do stuff on their outside edge or on their inside edge. So if they're going around a cone or around a dot, only on one foot on their inside edge and making sure their body's in a good position. Again, going back to our hockey player position, but our shoulders would be over our knee our knee over our toe, our foot that's in the air would be behind us, so our body weight's in a good position, and then controlling that edge for as long as we can around a cone or a dot. And once players get better on their edges, they're going to be able to perform every skating skill much better, whether it's a crossover, a quick stop start, backward skating, forward skating, every aspect will get better, the better they are on their edges. And the toughest edge for young players to work on and, and master is their outside edge. A lot of times you see that outside edge dragging, or not being able to perform properly on that outside edge. So getting players to be better balanced on that outside edge and understand and trust their edge so that when they're leaning into it, they're not afraid of falling or that edge slipping out. And again, all that comes back to just repetition and practice and really taking the time to break it down and work on it in specific areas so kids get a chance to really understand what their edges are and how to use them. Cool. So, I mean, yeah, on the off side of things, basically we kind of look at balance, we'll look at strength, we'll look at power, we'll look at endurance. Those are kind of the main kind of foundation. There's other little things that we'll look at. Um, and then where do they sit in terms of what a hockey player needs in balance between those things? So, so for example, sometimes we get players come in, once they've learned all these um, kind of different fundamental patterns, we'll say we do a trap bar deadlift. And maybe you get one player who's able to trap bar deadlift, let's say, two to two and a half times their body weight, but they can only jump, let's say, 24 inches. So now we can see there's a bit of a, a gap between their strength. That's pretty solid if you're lifting, say, two, two and a half times your body weight. We don't need to go way beyond that for sure to be a, an effective hockey player. But at a 24-inch vertical, that's below kind of your average, say, OHL or, or definitely NHL kind of player. And that's related to kind of your quick start and that's being able to snap real quick. So we're going to spend more time on with that player on power, whereas maybe with another player, if they come in, and I've seen this too. They'll have like a 32, 33 inch vertical, pretty good. And um, they can't organize themselves to lift, say, their own body weight on a trap bar. So by doing that, ultimately we want players to be more powerful. And by making them stronger, if someone's already powerful, we can you see those numbers start to go up. So we're not looking to necessarily bring you know, that player into a, a power lift or anything like that. But if they're, say, doing a 33 inch vertical and they can only trap bar deadlift or say something like that, um, their body weight, if we bring that number up, we'll see the, the power scores go up as well. So it's interesting to look at every athlete as an individual and where do they sit on, say, their strength to power ratios because some can produce tons of force but can't produce it fast, right? So and we do want to peak everyone to produce that force fast. Which that'll <laughs> hinder how fast they're going to be able to move on the ice, right? Exactly. Even though they're powerful, right? They're not going to be able to... Or even though they're strong. They're strong, so yeah, yeah exactly. they're not So gonna, they can yeah. produce a lot of force, but they can do it slowly. Yeah. And on the ice, it's important to be able to produce that force fast. So, and we see that all the time, honestly. There'll be guys that come in and they can lift a tons of weight, but they can't jump. 
they can't move through these like quick, snappy uh, kind of positions. So we're going to spend more time with that guy on those things. Whereas if someone comes in again, they're powerful, whatever, they don't have a ton of strength, we're going to start to build on that. We're going to keep working on power, but we have a little bit more bias towards the strength side, whereas for the other guy, we'd have a little bit more bias towards the power side. Um, and then we can look at endurance. And we're not looking to turn guys into, say, marathon runners or even like, you know, even like a 10K runner or whatever. Um, we want them to be able to recover quickly between shifts. We want to be able to replicate powerful shifts so that they can, every time they come out, whether it's the first period or the third period, they're able to drive just as fast as they were when they started. Um, so a lot of our kind of circuits or different types of training that we do for that replicates that scenario. So where things will be quick, fast, rest for a second, quick, fast, rest for a second, and we'll expose them to that until they hit a drop-off point. Um, and we see some guys that, again, they need more of that and some that, that everyone does it, but it needs less. So we basically, the way we do things is uh, everyone's kind of working on all these different components, but the percentage that is um, kind of uh, delegated to each of those different components is different based on what their current makeup is. And we want each percentage to kind of balance out for what's optimal as a hockey player. And that would be different for a football player, that would be different for a volleyball player, that would be different for every athlete. Um, so that's where we look, kind of what we look at for the, uh, on the performance side. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> yeah, which makes total sense. Now, if you have a young athlete, I mean, let's say he's 11, 12, or she's 11, 12, um, budget was an issue, so they're not going to be able to go to a personal trainer or to a gym. What would a couple of key exercises, or what, what are a couple of key exercises that you would recommend for them to do just at home, something that would they be able to work at, not knowing if they're strong, if they're powerful, not knowing that stuff just because they wouldn't have access to a professional in that field yet. Um, what are some things that they could do that wouldn't hurt them, first of all, and second of all, would add some benefit to their overall performance on the ice? I know it sounds really basic, but just coming, coming back to just kind of simple uh, movement patterns. So, I mean, like, push-ups are just a great exercise. And I think it's super um, even undervalued in a gym setting. A lot of times people will come into, the, come into a gym and then they get introduced to dumbbell presses and barbell presses, and all of a sudden push-ups get thrown out the window. Whereas with, uh, say, a dumbbell or a barbell press, your, your scapula, your shoulder blades, are kind of in a fixed position, which is not natural. Um, whereas in a push-up, your shoulder blades move on your rib cage, which is a far more natural thing. So, I mean, push-ups are a great exercise. Um, different rowing variations with rings or something like that. You can, there are some affordable options to kind of have stuff like that at home. Um, and then when we look at lower body, I mean, learning how to do a squat pattern. And we have video resources online where people can learn to do those things with a low budget uh, lunge patterns. And then once those look good, you can turn them into something a little bit quicker, say whether that's squat jumps or that's lunge jumps. And it needs to follow a progression where um, you're not doing explosive stuff until you understand the pattern at a slow speed first. So like say for a, a lunge, I'm not going to get someone starting to do lunge jumps when they can't maintain um, alignment just doing a stationary, simple uh, lunge pattern. So I guess my advice would be to start with um, just those simple patterns, which are pretty easy to find online, like a lunge pattern, how to do it properly, a squat pattern, how to do it pop properly. And then you can kind of assess yourself a little bit and then start to add reps, add speed, um, and that type of thing. And then sprints. I mean, just go into a hill and doing hill sprints and that kind of thing. And you could even sprint up, do some push ups at the top, walk down, sprint up, do some push ups at the top, walk down. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different options um, for players to do if they don't have the, uh, the resources to kind of see a trainer or, or anything like that. And there's this thing called uh, the internet, right? <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of good, lots right. of bad, but there's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you can find. You can find tons but, of But And I think the, 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 the key here is being able to, number one, being able to control your body a little bit before you start sprinting or doing lunges or doing squats, understanding and looking in a mirror even and watching yourself do just going down into a squat position and not, you know, not bending the back too much and yeah. not having your knees cave in, little things like that. And then once that foundation's there, then being able to do your sprints and get mm -hmm. into more stuff like that. I remember when I was young, uh, playing minor hockey, we got a new, uh, we got a running program sent to us, and I'd never ran before. So I, I mean, I couldn't even run for two minutes. It was awful. So basically, the That's running, changed. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but back then, I remember this and looking at the program, and the program <clears throat> actually had a run walk sequence to it. Mm -hmm. So you'd wear a stopwatch, and you literally run for a minute, walk for thirty seconds, run for a minute, walk for thirty seconds. So you can start off super, super simple. If you're at yeah. home and you can do one push up. No problem. If you can do 10 push-ups in a month, that's amazing, right? So yeah, getting those little gains huge. is big. Even squatting or lunging at home, if five squats gives you the biggest leg burn you've ever had, then obviously you've got some work to do. But guarantee if you stick with it, 
within a month, two months, you're going to be doing triple that if you're doing it right and you're and you're consistently working at it. For sure, and uh, yeah, I mean the the list really is endless. Like I mean, like wall sits. Um, yeah, there's, there's those are fun. Of those are yeah, those patterns, are really yeah. those are really yeah. fun. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then also that uh, kind of the the third point here for on ice for us is once you've got your hockey player position nailed and you've understand your edges and you're getting better at your edges. Um, the third thing for us would be overall skating technique. So looking at how a player is skating. So how their upper body's moving, how their lower body's moving, how everything is moving together in sequence. And a lot of times coaches neglect the upper body, which is a very, very important piece of skating. So making sure our head's square, our shoulders are square, our heads up. And with our, with our arms, uh, many coaches teach arms pumping back and forth, but we're not sprinting. So our, Feet are going out at a 45 degree angle. Therefore, our arms should be going out at some sort of an angle. Swinging directly in front of our body, side to side, kind of going east west, uh, totally counteracts what your lower body is doing. Yeah. Your lower body is trying to push you forward, and your upper body is taking you side to side. Having those arms going back at a 45 is a great idea. So, coming back kind of on the same pattern as the leg, but not crossing too far out in front of your body. And then having your legs being efficient. So, when you're striding out, we always talk about straight line skating. So if you and I were the same speed and we were skating down the ice and I was skating in a bit curvy lines and you were skating straight, you'd beat me every time if we were the same speed. So really focusing on like a one-legged lunge or a one-legged squat, focusing on that stride leg, driving down on the ice and that glide leg loaded and that knee pointing straight up the ice. And then when I recover, that foot comes under and that foot that was gliding is now striding out and I'm skating in straight lines as much as I can down the ice. And focusing on just that proper technique, not kicking our heels when we finish a stride. One thing we emphasize with players of all levels is snapping our toe. And you and I were having a discussion about this before today. Uh, finishing strides by snapping your toe. Whether it's a quick start, you're finishing a forward stride, you're finishing a backward stride, whatever that is, really focusing on snapping your toe and finishing that stride, fully extending your legs on your stride. A lot of times players, they finish their stride, but their knees are still bent making sure that they've snapped their toe, fully extend that leg. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, you had mentioned some stuff about even just Olympic lifts, which I know are a little bit advanced for young kids, but any kind of movement pattern where kids are aware of their joints and that's going to directly translate to how they're skating on the ice. Yeah. So basically, I mean, when it comes to the skating, what that's called when your ankle, your knee and your hip all work together to produce that force um, in summation is uh, triple extension. So, I mean, whether you're sprinting, skating, doing cleans, like the exercise cleans, um, you, all those joints have to work together in triple extension to produce force, to produce power. So a lot of people, when they do cleans, they just kind of push the bar out and catch it on their shoulders, but learning how to extend those, the ankle, the knee, and the hip together to produce force um, is, is essential. So, I mean, we don't necessarily, we, I've had players come and be like, you know what, I, I'm not really comfortable doing cleans. And this is like a professional player I'm thinking of, and I know you guys do cleans here. It's like everyone here is individual, and I have a background in Olympic weightlifting, so I like to teach it, and I see a lot of value in it. But anything that's going to give a player that element of triple extension is going to be helpful for producing power on the ice. So that can be something as simple as like a jump. Like the number of people that come in for the first time, and this is part of the process in teaching a clean, is can you jump and land in the same spot? A lot of people can't. So like <laughs> yeah. if you can't jump and land in the same spot, you can't really do it. I'm, I'm not going to have you do a clean. I'll tell you that. So, I mean, you need to be able to go through triple extension, jump straight up and then land back in the same spot. So when you, yeah, you have to be able to do that in order to do a clean because it's the same pattern, but you don't actually jump. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, so for like learning players, triple extension is important. So for young players, yeah. just learning how to jump and land in the same spot is is an awesome drill. Skipping, we do tons of skipping and warm ups and that type of thing. I would highly recommend young players. The number of kids that come in who I I think when you're a young kid you should be able to skip. They're like <laughs> 10 years to 13, 15 years old. Give them a skip roll. First, they don't even know what it is, and then they can't jump <laughs> over the damn thing. Yeah. So. I would highly recommend everyone have a, like a skipping rope or something like that and just start learning some different patterns. I mean, you can do two-foot patterns. You can do high-knee patterns. You can do, yeah, single-foot patterns back and forth. I mean, it's a, an amazing tool um, that is super undervalued. You don't see a lot of people doing it. No, it's and we, so and true. And we use them all the time. And, I mean, as a hockey player, you see quite a few, like, high ankle sprains and different things like that. So training that ankle joint and strengthening everything in your ankle, your calf, your lower leg, it is a huge, huge piece, and it's a preventative uh, type of measure you can take um, for some of those injuries that, you know, 
you obviously don't want to encounter. Yeah, and I, I would say one of the probably the biggest things we haven't touched on yet, and we can kind of finish it off here. The biggest, biggest piece of all this is flexibility, right? Is yeah. being able to you know touch your toes as simple as that is, right? Or or bend your knees and be able to get down to the ground, or even sit. Yeah, you know, I, I remember one time you joking about just being able to sit down and watch TV. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, and as we get older, <laughs> on that the gets floor, not on the couch. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And as we get older, that gets harder and harder. But yeah. for these young kids, I mean, some of them can't do that even. Right. Like sit on the like literally sit on the floor. I'll, I'll say that to kids. Like when you're playing video games, whatever it is you do at home, just sit cross-legged for a bit, or sit on your sit on your knees with your butt on your heels, that kind of thing. Well, even so, I mean, yeah. And a lot of them they can't do it. These are just very general things. When we say flexibility, like we're not looking to, ch- you know, turn these kids into gymless levels of flexibility. We don't need guys to be doing splits or anything like that. But flexibility is something in strength and conditioning. If anyone follows it, people have started saying, like saying things as crazy as like that. You just don't need to do it, which is so incredibly wrong. Like, I mean, it's not, it's yeah, it's super illogical. It doesn't even make sense. Um, yeah. So and, and flexibility is super, super important. And something as simple as sitting on the floor. I mean, if you can't do that comfortably for half an hour even like uh, you should be able to do that yeah and i remember i mean back when i was young which is about 100 years ago in school we, you know we'd have to sit, sit down yeah, yeah cross leg sitting down and now as as a as an elderly gentleman <laughs> um you know that's a tougher position to get into so for some of these young kids <clears throat> not being able to do it they need to take pride in being a little bit flexible or working on their flexibility and you've seen it firsthand it's not hard to become more flexible no, it just takes takes some effort. Yeah, yeah, just putting it a little bit of time. But as you mentioned earlier, a lot of our young listeners, a lot of our young players, they play video games, they watch movies. This thing called Netflix, they're all into, right? Yeah. Well, while well, you're well, taking that time, it's a perfect time to work on that while you're watching or playing or doing whatever you're doing to on some downtime. And this is just one really simple, like just to give some, people kind of an idea of something you can test and just see if you're able to do it. So this combines not only flexibility but also a little bit of core strength. So something we want all of our players to be able to do before we're getting into something like, say, deadlifts, where you're having to actually take some weight in your hands and, and put tension through your body. So sit on the floor with your feet straight out in front of you like you were going to touch your toes, and then put your hands up over your head, and you just try to sit in an L sort of shape position. So your legs and your torso create an L shape. With your, your back should be straight. You shouldn't be slumped over. A lot of people, and this is not like crazy flexible. We're talking about sitting at 90 degrees. Yeah. A lot of people can't do that, and that is not just flexibility, but a lot of times core strength as well. So if you don't have the core strength and the flexibility to sit in a position like that, even just getting into a good hockey player position, to be honest, is going to be challenging. Um, Being able to deadlift is totally out of the question. So, I mean, something as simple as that. So we're not talking about just touching your toes. And some people who can touch their toes can't do this. You know what I mean? So it's not just flexibility. There's an element of strength to that. Um, It is a really good little test. That's a great test. And for a young kid trying that or – uh, even an older player trying that, um, they could easily use or try that with their back against the wall to begin, totally. and then move out from the so wall. The way, to s- yeah, to see how that core. core the way we'll just- do it is, um, f- for starters, we'll have them sit with their butt against the wall, with their legs up the wall, and their back on the ground, and then they'll progress from that to back on the wall, and then they'll progress from that to coming off of the wall. And this can happen pretty quickly. Like this is like maybe even in a day, like maybe in one session. Um, and then there's a couple other little core exercises we can use, like bird dogs and dead bugs, but I can't really explain those <laughs> over, over this thing. But for the most part, those three things, like just doing the feet up the wall, back up the wall, and then move away from the wall, most people can get it. Um, and it's a yeah, super valuable, simple thing you can work on. No, that's great. And that, those, are kind of, those are the kind of things I think that are... Overlooked. That are val- yeah, overlooked and super valuable, yeah, right? Like for, just, yeah. yeah, for anybody. And for parents too, I mean... We don't expect an eight-year-old to figure this stuff out on their own or no. a 10-year-old or even a 12, 13, 14-year-old, yeah. right? But as a parent or a coach, I mean, I think it's our job to help direct these young players. And yeah. if you see our player can't touch their toes, then putting them on a bit of a flexibility program is, yeah. you know, and a lot of times it's not that hard. I know the players will be like, I don't want to do it. I'm not, I'm not doing this, yeah. right? But there's easy ways to motivate those players. You oh, take yeah. away their Xbox or <laughs> you, right? you shut down Netflix for a week. Um, there's a lot of easy, you know, easy ways to get these kids motivated. It's funny now too because with things like social media, who's posting about touching their toes or sitting, sitting in an L-shaped type of position? Like what people are posting are like dangles. So the like kids want to dangle. What are they, They're posting about lifting 300 pounds. They're posting about all these like feats of strength or like cool looking things. Whereas those people that are performing those cool things usually are doing a lot of other little things 
to be able to do that stuff. And those yeah. are the things you don't see. You don't see that on social media. Right. And that's what is people are getting like bombarded with all of these like fancy looking things. And you can get there, but there's a lot of underlying stuff that's happening that's not that fancy. So no one wants to watch your Instagram video about it. Um, yeah. that, that people need to be doing. Yeah, yeah. right. You're probably not going to get a lot of hits on touching your toes on the no. on the uh, no. the old Instagram. Um, and I think the other thing too with a lot of the, a lot of the uh, a lot of any player, high end. Uh, minor hockey players doesn't matter is coming back to those fundamentals and really focusing and even the NHL guys that you know that we'll we start our off season with all that same stuff like just yeah. basic hip hinging stuff basic ankle mobility drills basic single leg control drills all this stuff and we'll do those at the beginning of workouts for the first yeah couple months like I mean they're here for only four months and we're doing it actually the whole time to some at some capacity yeah and yeah. same with on the ice on the ice we're working on le- you know legit fundamentals with with NHL guys on mm-hmm. one-legged strides edging and then obviously morphing into more complex movements and and more prop protection stuff but using their edges and all those fundamentals you can see tied into high-end drills or high-end skills exactly so the better that those fundamentals are especially at the young ages the tighter their fundamentals are, the better they're going to be long terms as they get to those next levels, whether it's midget AAA or junior or college or pro or whatever it is. If those fundamentals are tight, then they're going to have a way better opportunity to succeed. Well, just even on that point, like, so we talk about fundamentals, but what what is that really? Like, the fundamentals, just so everyone can kind of understand, like, they are part of the complex things. That's why they're fundamentals. I think some people overlook even what the whole, what that means. But, like, when you do a hip hinge or you do whatever, you that's part of doing a deadlift or that's part of doing a clean. So you can't learn to do that other thing before you learn this fundamental. And really in the learning process, this is something I kind of keep myself to. If I can't teach someone how to do something in say five minutes or at least make a lot of progress in like that first five minutes, then they're missing a lot of these, a lot of smaller pieces that should have came before that. So by the time someone's learning a clean, I can teach them how to do it pretty well within five minutes. I'm not saying they're a master of cleans, but they're not looking like garbage. You know yeah. what I mean? Because they already know how to hip hinge. They already know how to jump on the spot. They already know how to pull the bar in a straight line. They already know how to hold a front rack position. So those would be kind of like the main fundamental pieces of a clean. If they don't know those pieces or can't perform those pieces, then they can't do the clean. So the same kind of thing you're saying. Like, I mean, all the your hockey player position and all this stuff, they aren't able to do that stuff effectively. It's going to be a lot harder to do complex skills effectively because they're all still present. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. And I think, you, you know, maybe maybe more than fundamentals, it's building blocks, right? <clears throat> building You've got your block exactly. number one, your block number two, yeah. your block 20, your block 30. And for a lot of these young players, they're missing block one and two and three. And yeah. they're at, already at four, five, six, but they're not going to be able to get to eight, nine, ten because one and two are missing. Exactly. And that's where I hope that, you know, some of this stuff that we're talking about today and that we're going to continue to talk about will give players, parents, coaches a good opportunity to to look back and say, okay, we need to focus on these key little elements. So to recap a little bit on today, we have obviously our, your body position. So how you move off the ice, how you move on the ice, but how you control your body. And a lot of times, you know, we kind of relate it to a piece of spaghetti, but I see a kid coming down the ice and it looks like a piece of spaghetti. Yeah. Everything's moving. It's the like same fingers thing. are like, moving, yeah. toes are moving, hips are moving, shoulders, yeah. head. Cooked and piece of spaghetti. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not a, overcooked. Yeah, that's right. Not raw. <laughs> yeah. um, so th- those are things that, if they get those building blocks hammered at a young age, they're, they they don't look like a piece of spaghetti anymore. They yeah, look right. way more In control. Tight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. W- way more control. And as parents and coaches, especially for the young players, is making sure that they have those little fundamentals. And that doesn't mean you need to spend six days a week downstairs in your basement working on this stuff. No. Um, and I think it's very important for these kids to be playing other sports and being athletic and kicking a ball, throwing a ball, hitting a ball with a bat, riding a bicycle. I mean, I was talking to some buddies of mine, their, their kids are six and seven, don't know how to ride a bike yet. I think it's important. It's, it's crazy. Important. It's yeah, important. It's for just, sure. It's, your brain is always attached to your body. And I'm a firm believer that the more things that your brain can comprehend, I think that you'll pick up other things faster. (laughs) Like I really do. Like if you just can just, I understand that like riding a bike doesn't look like skating, but there's a lot of things that your brain has to learn how to do. Whether that's balance, that's just basic coordination, whatever it is. I mean, it's always there and it's always, it remembers all these other things and it's easier to pick new things up when you have a foundation of other things. Like it's just, Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. No, for sure. Well, it's great, Mitch. Uh, thanks for coming in again today. It's great. I'm going to keep picking your brain for as long as I can. So, uh, as long as I can.
awesome. Yeah, yeah really good job. It's Thanks, great. buddy. <laughs>